Who is the real Watson of the Three Taps? Catherine Lumby on morality and crime fiction? And could we see a citizen's arrest before the detectives strike? All that and more, now on Death of the Reader. You're listening to to a CR 107.3, and we are Flex and Herds. I'm Flex, he's Herds, and we are bringing you Death of the Reader, your murder mystery world tour. Today we'll be continuing our journey out into the British countryside with chapters 8 to 17 of The Three Tamps by Ronald A. Knox. I decided to split the book up like this so today we can focus on how the detective chases down a criminal. Uh, in our last talk, we had a passive detective, and this, he's active and out for blood. He and his crack team of experts are chasing down the scent, but the other residents of the town aren't helping at all. The detective's out for blood. So yes. It's a bit misleading, but yeah, he's, he's, he's out, out for, for blood. That, he's out cigarettes. for that criminal. <laughs> uh, tell you who else is out for that criminal. Tell me. Angela, <gasps> the best character in this book. Objectively, she doesn't get enough screen time. Let's be real. <laughs> we, we spoke a bit about how amazing Angela was last week, both amongst ourselves and with the amazing Andrew Popel from Final Draft. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that these next few chapters really go to show just how amazing Angela is in this circumstance. She's an actual expert in social engineering, which I love. Uh, and I'm looking forward to having a little chat about her because she, she may have sold my heart just a little bit. So it's stick, a shame she's married. <laughs> stick around for that. <laughs> but uh, these chapters is kind of the middle bit of the book, which is interesting in a, a novel like a murder mystery because most stories, the hero's trying to like defeat the villain. You've got Mr. Skull with his big death sword. But in a murder mystery, you're kind of trying to find the villain. Yeah, I think that in a lot of conventional storytelling, we have, you know, the villain, the yeah. bad guy, because people want someone to root against. Or if you're a modern Netflix audience, you want someone to root for because mm-hmm. that's the, that's what Netflix seems to be into these days. I'm okay with that. I'm entirely down for that. More sympathetic villains. Let's go. That's another discussion unto <laughs> itself. <laughs> but, yeah, but yeah. I think that Knox's approach here in terms of creating drama without a villain is really interesting. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's kind of a case of rather than you know. Leyland versus Breton. It's mm, yeah. Leyland and Breton versus the problem. Yes, yes. They're both trying to solve the problem, but they both uh, have their vested interests in a certain outcome. So they are competing. They're in a sense, uh, not hero and villain, but certainly they are obstacles to each other in that they're trying to both lay out their theories, um, which is always exciting. And along the way, we meet all sorts of colorful, suspicious characters. <laughs> Extremely <laughs> suspicious characters. Shall we talk about some of the clues that we've been, we've been presented? Sure. What do you think is the most misleading thing you can present <laughs> me with today, Herds? Uh, I mean, that's a loaded question, Flex. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of wanted to talk about the whole cigarette situation. Sure. Uh, because it's definitely the the kind of the biggest example of how Breton and Leyland try to actively, you know, go after the crook. Let's uh, let's not forget it was Angela's idea. It's absolutely <laughs> Angela's idea. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, they're chatting around the mill house and they they hear you know the sound of someone running away and there's a cigarette left at the crime scene. The expert team decide that they're going to use this cigarette to try and track down the killer, and so they uh, they ask Angela for help. Of course, of course, our, because our brilliant social engineer. Ask? Yeah, they're like, yo, Angela. How do we catch this person? We need to show them to like, we need to get them to show us the inside of their cigarette cases, Brinkman and Pulteney, because these are the two smokers of the of the household. And she says, she says, well, don't you worry, leave everything to me. You guys can be in the conversation, but just don't say anything. And there's a really great moment where Brennan, they're, they're making some comment about how like high strung there are. And Brennan's like, you mean you, you, you feel like spicy, like, like tobacco or something? And she kicks him under the table. <laughs> It's great. I think as we were saying last week, Angela is a brilliant example of how to do Watson correctly, how to do the Watson type character. And I think that scene is a really great example of why, because the detective can't really be the social engineer and, you know, and the detective. We can't be everything. Then he'd just be boring. He wouldn't be a flawed character. Exactly. That's why we have this splitting of like, this person's good at social stuff. This person's good at the intellectual stuff. Although one could also argue that Angela is also smarter than him. But you know what? <laughs> Brennan, he's a pretty face. Well, I, I think that it's it's not necessarily about the smarts for the Watson. It's more sure. about 
their their engagement with the social thing. There's there's some le- level of sociopathy with detectives mm. where they have to be able to remove themselves from the situation and say like, I think this is what happened using these clues, and not really worry about yeah, uh, not not really worry about what people's thoughts and feelings were about it. And yeah. often in particularly famous detective stories, mm. that's the clinch as the detective realizes like, oh god, I have to be a human in this moment. Yeah, for because sure. they were doing it for a good reason. Well, that's that's maybe something that should be considered, especially as because the kind of the the reveal um, that happened at this at the start of these set of chapters was that the money from uh, Mottram's euthanasia policy would go to the go, church. Go, go to the church, Ben? The bishop, yeah. You mean exactly what I said? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you're just you're just clutching at straws, my friend. Your theories are half-baked. Clutching at steel wrought straws that hold this society together. That's awful. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't seen no straws of that kind. I think you make it up, sir. There definitely is a very uh, defined elegance with the way that Knox lays out his puzzles in that Mm. manner. Um, You know, even as I was saying last week where I was so extraordinarily suspicious of Brinkman, there was was always this doubt in my mind that Mm. Brinkman was a murderer. Yeah. Um, And I think that the clues that were laid out in chapters 8 to 17 really kind of fleshed out what those doubts were. They definitely portray him as being very suspicious. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say before we get to the third section. But... uh... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he's definitely hiding something. And we'll definitely get to this when we're, we're discussing who we think the culprit is later in the show. But I do think that Brinkman is trying to assuade himself of the crime by assisting the, the detectives in their method of deduction right? rather than misleading them. Well, this is one of the interesting things coming back to, to Layla and Brett and their sort of relationship, how they, they both want to, you know, say it's murder or suicide and they'll both see the same piece of evidence and they'll spin it both ways. Yes. So when they find this, the single scrap of paper that's been held by fingers like into a fire, um, uh, Leyland said, well, obviously it's a murderer trying to hide the evidence. And then Breton says, well, obviously if they were actually trying to hide the evidence, they wouldn't have left that little scrap of paper there. In fact, I don't even think it was in the room until after we investigated the crime scene the first time. And so they'll like both characters, both competent individuals, both intelligent people. One is a detective, though, obviously. But they both find the exact same piece of evidence and they they spin it around. If you can think of this murder mystery like a well laid out chessboard, they're spinning it around. They're trying to think of it from the angle of of the criminal or the lack of a criminal, which is the fun part. Trying to figure out which way around the evidence goes. And if you spin it so many times, you're going to fall over. I th- I think that that's. One of the fantastic things about just logic in general, and pati- particularly perspective-based logic, yeah. is that you can you can just flip it as many times as you want. The whole angle of reverse psychology, you can just go, but it's reverse psychology, but it's reverse, reverse psychology. Yeah, you go, it's yeah. reverse, reverse, reverse yeah, psychology, totally. so on ad infinitum. And I think that the way that that scene plays out almost seems like a criticism of that trope. And I like <laughs> the way that it's presented both as a criticism without really taking you out of the moment. Yeah, no, I think that's one of the greatest strengths is that even though there is comedy and absurdism, some breaking of the fourth wall, um, the novel does a really good job of putting you in the shoes of the detective um, and like putting it like you, you feel like uh, you're in that conversation between Leland and Breda and you're discussing which way the evidence is going and at the end of it, because there is no like 100%, you know, realization, he hasn't pointed at the criminal and said, you are the criminal. You're the reader, like encouraged to make your own deduction. Yeah. One of Knox's decalogue is that uh, the detective must not light on any clues, which are not mm. instantly produced for the inspection of the reader. Yep. And I think that this scene is an example of how to do that rule well. well. Yep. It doesn't feel clunky. It feels very organic. Um, even the entirely scripted conversation between Leyland and Breton where they try to set up Brinkman. One thing that I really liked, just for characterization's sake, where Leyland, who is a cop, and he's done this a lot of times, he's tried to like set, up, set people up through conversations like this, um, and Breton, who obviously hasn't. But if you look at the dialogue, the way it flows, Breton's paragraphs are almost entirely him thinking to himself and then three or four word sentences, and that's it. Whereas Leyland's are like these full paragraphs. So showing that characterization of how Leyland is obviously very used to uh, playing with criminals and trying to trick them into revealing themselves or, or help innocents to, you know, come forward with evidence, that sort of thing. And Breton isn't as used to that sort of thing. I really like the way that they characterize them in that scene. 
I'm really looking forward to uh, if if we go on and read any of the other Miles Brennan mysteries. I think there are five of them. Seeing if there is a character arc for him, you know, seeing how he changes because I feel like that's a it's not a part of all serialized, you know, novel series, but I feel like that might be interesting to see maybe how Knox changes his writing as he went forward. I, I will say that given my limited experience with Ronald Knox, aside from dealing with his rules for so long, yeah, uh, I, I think that I would have faith that he's the kind of author that would break that ground and have an arc for his detective, mm. because that's definitely a more modern addition to the, to the detective fiction genre and- Knox seems like the kind of guy that's pretty ahead of the curve in that way. I would agree. I would agree. I'm looking forward to it. Can't wait to be proved 100% wrong. <laughs> Coming up next on the show, we have Professor Catherine Lumby from Macquarie University talking with us a bit about morality and why our story without a moral can have interesting implications. Stick around. You're on 2SCR, we're on 7.3, listening to Death of the Reader, and I am here with Catherine Lumby, uh, Professor of Media at Macquarie University. Uh, Catherine, how are you today? Yeah, very good. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Uh, of course, we have our regulars, uh, Flex. Hey, hey. And Hertz, myself. Yeah, we've been talking today about The Three Taps. It's a detective story without a moral, and we just want to talk a little bit about why morality is so important to stories and how it helps us engage with them, uh, particularly murder mysteries, but also in other genres like horror. It's one thing that we've spoken a, a bit about as we've progressed through this novel, the difficulty of having a crime story that's subtitle is A Story Without a Moral. Yeah. So, uh, Catherine, I guess I just want to ask you going into this, how familiar are you with crime fiction? Yeah, very familiar. Um, uh, the, the, what I like, well, it's a, it's a subgenre really of crime fiction. I like sort of um, serial killer fiction, mm. um, and and there's some interesting research done by Professor Stuart Turnbull from the University of Wollongong mm. into in Australia into who reads that kind of fiction, and generally speaking, it's tertiary educated women. Um, and you, and you, I mean, there's an interesting question in that, which is why would you know well educated women um, who many of whom would identify as feminists want to read stories about women being <laughs> cut up, murdered, and raped. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, and part of her thesis is that um, very often those stories have a strong kind of narrative in which the killer gets caught. So there's a kind of catharsis, if you like. So in a way, it speaks to um, a kind of anger and fear that a lot of women live with about the fact that um, they're vulnerable in a, in a very gendered society in which a small minority of men are violent towards women. Mm. Yeah, and this particular story, it, it advertises itself as a, being a story without a moral. Uh, obviously, you talked a little bit there about the, the catharsis of reading novels like that where bad things happen to, to good or innocent people uh, and then there's some comeuppance in the end. Uh, do you think that's relevant to... Uh, you're particularly interested in true, true crime, correct? Yeah, well, what's interesting there is, to me, just on the story without a moral, mm. is um, Charles Dodson, who's, um, who wrote under the, the pen name Lewis Carroll, had an ambiguous interest in young children, <laughs> mm. and um, I, I use that word intentionally, um, because we don't really know, but what his interest was, in some ways you could say it produced wonderful works of fiction, that he um, had an exchange of letters with young friends, where he sent her a, a Victorian children's book, and he said... This book is not by Lewis Carroll. It has a moral in it. Needless to say, mm. do not read it. Just put it on the shelf. And I always found that incredibly amusing because, in a sense, um, if you read, say, Lewis Carroll's books, one of the things about them was he was trying to write against the grain of didactic, moralistic Victorian literature for children. And I do think that there's something incredibly interesting and worthy about um, someone pursuing a project where they're they're trying to avoid telling the reader what they should feel or think. Mm. Do you think that that's a, a reasonable kind of approach to try and create a novel without a without a moral or without a, a lesson in it? Well, it may be less satisfying in the short term to the reader, but I think in the long term it's far more interesting because that takes us out of the zone of morality and into the zone of ethical ambiguity, which we all exist in, mm. whether we like to think about it or not. And um, and I think that 
when you talk to people who say work in the criminal justice system, you know, I mean, from the outside, we'd like to think things are black and white, that there are people with white hats and black hats. But in reality, most um, matters for the criminal court have zones of ambiguity in them. Yeah. Uh, And coming back to that idea of true crime, which you spoke about on a a recent piece uh, on uh, to a CR, uh, do you think there's a a moral equivalence between how we approach nonfiction uh, murder mystery or fictional cases? Yeah. Look, I mean, I think that there are parallels, actually, Mm. most strikingly. Um, I think that, you know, we narrativize crime in the mainstream media, so true crime, things that happen. Mm. Um, And and there's a very long history of that. And in a tabloid, Sense, there's a long history of people voyeuristically consuming that material. And I don't think that any of us are immune to that. You know, it's a bit like we, we kind of half cover our eyes, but we sort of want to know and we sort of want to know the details. And there's a lot of there are good ethical criticisms of the way in which we consume stories of rape and murder, which are true stories. Um, and, and we are voyeurs in that sense. Um, yeah. And so I, I think that there, are, that, that there's a, a real continuum between the true crime and the kind of the fictional um, work, for sure. Yeah, there's definitely, a, I think, a parallel between the way that we consume true crime stories and, and fictional uh, stories of the same nature, uh, and even horror stories. Uh, a lot of slasher uh, films are based in real life, situ- in, you know, real life stories. Um, mm. I can't remember its name, but there's one in particular in the Australian outback, but a bunch of teens getting lost in the woods. Of course, that's a lot of horror, you know, slasher films, mind you. <laughs> well, Wolf Creek's a great. That's the one, yeah. It? It's, it's, a, it's a fantastic, um, it's about backpackers. But mm. see, I mean, horror films are interesting. I love horror films. I mean, they're, a, again, a genre of, and they, and very often, if you look at the really best horror films, you look at films by Tobe Hooper or Wes Craven, for mm. instance, uh, George Romero, they actually have um, political allegories buried in them. Yeah. Um, and And I think that, you know that, that in a way there there is a an allegorical dimension to to those uh, films and yeah. and to and to kind of crime. I think we read uh, morality and so forth into it. I think that's one of the fascinating things about murder mysteries in particular is the way that we as an audience approach that through the perspective of typically the detective who's the one trying to catch and stop further crimes. So regardless of the the premise of the story itself, we still have that strong direction of catch the bad guy, which is kind of not, it's not as prevalent in other crime media like true crime and horror, that kind of moral direction of the detective. Yeah, that's right. And I I think that, you know, that's probably one of the big differences. If you look at fictionalized crime narratives and you look at true crime narratives, is that um, fictionalized crime narratives usually um, work on that kind of classic mythic structure where you've got to have a hero and, and, and you know, in a way they often work on a, on a distinct moral narrative, whereas, and we look for that clarity in true crime stories, but actually, as I said, um, there are often ambiguities in those cases. Um, and, and, you know, and tabloid media tends to kind of iron those ambiguities out because, in a sense, the narrative structure that they're looking for is one in which people have this sense of we got the bad guy. Mm. Now, I'm not saying there aren't people who objectively do evil or bad things, but, um, you know, that that's what that kind of tabloid narrative about crime relies on. I think that uh, that's also something that you kind of see in terms of which, even in crime fiction, which stories are more popular, because typically for detective mysteries in particular, some of the most famous ones through history are the ones where the characters with the grey the grey reasoning for why they carried out the crime uh, portrayed most authentically? Yeah, no, I think that's right. And I think coming back to what you were saying about this crime fiction narrative without a moral, that really appeals to me, actually, Hmm. because I think real life is much more like that. Yeah. That's all the time we have with Catherine Lumby today. If you want to hear an extended chat with her, be sure to check it out on the podcast and, of course, everything else that Catherine Lumby has helped us with on 2SER. She is an amazing, amazing contributor to the station. So thank you, Catherine. It's always a privilege and a pleasure. Thank you. It's time to fight. 
You're on Death of the Reader on 2SER 107.3, and it's time for Herds and I to throw down. Throw some punches. We're pitching theories. Let's do it, Flex. I'm ready to throw some kicks right into your notebooks. So as we beat each other over the head <laughs> with our theories, I've only read up to chapter 17, so I'm I'm the one solving here, while Herds is yeah. the expert. He's read the lot. Yeah, I am. I'm the one who knows everything. He's the person who knows about two-thirds of everything. And we are going to uh, we're going to talk about why Pulteney is the true mastermind uh, of the it all. The true mastermind. The true mastermind. I, I, I have so much to tell you. Now, you just don't even understand. Herds has titled this segment Citizens Arrest. Yeah, Citizens Arrest. Now- no one is doing a citizen's arrest in this but part of the story. But they're going to. Oh, goodness. This is the thing. And All right. We'll get into All right. it. All we'll right. get into it. We'll do you want to tell me, do you want to tell me who it is you suspect? It's obviously still Brinkman. No. You are wrong, sir. First of all, wrong. F- first of all, all right. If you were the detective, you would just get it wrong. And then Pulteney would get away and he'd yahoo it off into the woods and he'd fish all the fish he could ever eat. Okay, and, okay. And Brinkman would be put away for a crime he didn't commit, sir. Now, last week we already demonstrated that an 80-year-old man could not scale the outside of a two-story I'm building sure. with I reckon, a fishing I pole. my old man could do it. I'm just saying. This week, Pulteney has been cleared of nearly all suspicion. What? What makes you say that? I mean, Flex, he, come he, on. he goes outside, he finds a bunch of evidence, he's constantly helping the detectives. You see, that's just what he'd like you to think. You know what? That was definitely on my mind as I read through <laughs> this, right? There were definitely moments where I'm thinking to myself, well, it's a bit far-fetched that Pulteney even found these clues. It's true. But at the same time, I think it is much easier to assume the incompetence of Brinkman as he fails to cover his tracks. No. You see, here's the deal, and this is why it's a citizen's arrest. Okay. Brinkman, he's blacked out his license plate. Uh Uh-huh. He's put sandwiches in his car. He's got an unmarked map that doesn't show where he is or who he is, and he's got a fake license, all that stuff. You know why that is? Because he's afraid. Hold on. Are you suggesting that he is going to yes. stake out Pulteney's fishing spot and arrest him? Yes. And that's why he that's left exactly during the happening. funeral? He is afraid either that <laughs> or he is going to leave. Oh, he's going to no. go out in the woods. He's going to hide from Pulteney because Pulteney's out for blood. Oh. Pulteney's got his fishing hooks of murder death. It won't be taps this time. You can't kill Bill with taps twice. You got to get him with a fishing hook. I'd really and like Brinkman to see that. how one could kill a man with a fishing hook. It wouldn't be pretty. I, I feel like there's not much <laughs> surface area on the body where you could do enough damage with a lone fishing hook. I reckon, look, I've been hooked by a, a fishing hook a couple of times. Yeah, and you're still alive. Parents. Barely. Come on. <laughs> Have you ever been hooked with a fishing hook? It gets caught in your cheek and you're like, Dad, wait, don't. And then he goes. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And it rips right out of your face. Blood. There wasn't blood everywhere. Oh, it wasn't God. pleasant. Fishing's dangerous, kids. Well, <laughs> now, now, the thing is that we're getting with Brinkman is that Brinkman is becoming so increasingly suspicious the further we get into the novel mm. that I don't think it would be possible for you to dissuade me from the fact that he is responsible. Except if he's a red herring, which I think he is. However. However. Hurts. However. I think I'm ready to concede that he's not the murderer. Aha! I win. I think, I think I was absolutely dead right, pun intended, Mm -hmm. At the end of our last episode, when I said that Brinkman probably rocked up and accidentally killed the man and is now panicking, trying to trying to defend his honor, trying to defend his rightness in the eyes of the law. Now, it's a bit of a strange thing to say, right, that a man has has killed someone and thus he is he's he's not the murderer. Mm hmm. But I think that that's why so many of Brinkman's actions are being so easily uncovered. Look, I'm just saying, a little trip to the gorge, you know, if he was the person listening in on Breton and Leyland, why wouldn't he say anything? If he is innocent, if he's accidentally killed a man, surely you should come to the lawman and say, hey, accidentally killed a man. I, Help I, me out. He, here's what I think. What I think Brinkman is doing is he's realized that if he goes and presents himself to the police, he will then basically be put through a court case of responsibility Mm, over the death of Mottram. Mm. But by trying to get the detectives to naturally light upon the clues, he will hopefully basically give them all of the evidence he would want to present in a court case Mm. before it even gets to court. So he has 
the detectives on his side rather than working against okay, him as okay. the police typically would be in that case. I, I see how you feel and I see it. I see you and I say why or how would you accidentally kill someone? Is it like you get the knife halfway in and you're like, oops, I didn't mean it. And you just like take it back out. You're like, nah. Well, let's let's go back to Motram himself. Uh-huh. Motram has clearly made it seem like he committed suicide. Mm. Right? He left clues. He was excited the week before he came to the place, un- unusually so, according to Eames. He left his name in the guest book before checking out. All of these clues that have really been laid down for us, right? Mm. I think Motram has gone to stage his own death. The gas taps were going to be used as the murder of his fake suicide, but they screwed it up and he actually died. I'd, I'd probably be on the same side with you on that, that there's some kind of stitch up going on. I think that the stitch up is pretty blatant mm. that the the idea that Motram was doing something himself leading into this is undeniable, mm. I think at this point, but I think that Brinkman was part of Motram's plan. The plan went awry and Brinkman is trying to lay the clues out for the detective to prove his own innocence mm. while still his own responsibility. It seems like a dangerous game to be playing with a man of the law. It is definitely a dangerous game to play, but I think that the way that Brinkman carries himself, the way that Brinkman, especially in the first the first chapters we spoke about, was defending, you know, oh, it, was, it was obviously suicide. It was obviously suicide. Mm. And, you know, it would bring notoriety to the town. And then now we get into this chapter and we have the bishop show up. It, where dis- we discover that the money is probably going to go to the parish. Mm. Yeah. I think that a secretary, a man who is good at dealing with money, mm. being roped into the plan by the man with a lot of money to throw around... Mm. staging his own death and then finding a way for that money to be, you know, given out to that parish if the the bishop proved himself to be of good character, which seems to be one of the interesting contentions around the bishop in this chapter. Right. I think that Motram was going to stage his death, come back from the dead, and then give over his euthanasia policy money to the to the parish if they proved themselves. I, I think that we're definitely getting to the point in the story where you could still be right and I could still be right at the same time. If if the map to the unmarked location <laughs> was Poltney's fishing spot where he was going to smuggle Motram out to for Brinkman to recover and bring back to the hotel in a show of glory, yeah. I would not be surprised one bit, sir. Dude, that's... Look, this show's called Death of the Reader. We're all about Death of the Author here too. I'm just saying... We rewrite this novel, if that's what happens. If it turns out the Brinkman's, you know, the murder of the criminal, whatever, we rewrite it and we make him into the hero and vice versa. That's how we do it. If, if I'm right, and it turns out that Poltney is a savage murderer and Brinkman is trying to do good by his, by his king and country. We flip it around. I, Same I'm, deal. I'm really scared that I'm going to continue playing the audio book for next week that I've been listening to. And I'm just going <laughs> to hear Herd's voice. voice. There's going to be a little crackle like on the radio. And, and then it turned out that Pottery <laughs> came round the corner hurt. with his fishing hook in hand. But he lost his hand and he replaced it with a hook hand. And he went, yeah. And he's like a pirate. <laughs> and that's the end. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I, think, I think I'm definitely sticking with accident. All right. I'm sure. sticking with it was a plan between Brinkman and Motram. For sure. I will I will keep Poltney out of the equation for now. Boo. But I will I will honor your contributions <gasps> to the genre and say that it is it is plausible that Poltney was involved in this scheme. But not sweet baby Edward. No, I don't think so. I think that the way that Motram's character is presented, he would have explicitly left his family out of the equation. I'll be honest, I think you've been blinded by Angela. We're told. Angela says, you know, that's sweet Edward. It couldn't possibly be him. I think, look, as much as I love Angela, she blind. She blind. She doesn't even know. That's the worst thing you've said on this entire show. (laughs) I will not have this kind of disrespect thrown at Angela. (laughs) The best character, the smartest character. It's true. The best social engineer. She is a social engineer. That's what it says on a little plaque that she has on her desk. I'd believe it. Me too. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> thanks for tuning into death of the reader this week on 2ser if you want to catch any more from us be sure to check the podcast for some extended chats of oh. everything we spoke about yeah it sounds like fun you can catch us online on almost all of your favorite social media sites at flex and herds 
Next week, we'll have Chrissy Neen on the show, who is in town for the Sydney Writers' Festival to discuss her unique crime fiction take with The Wintering. All that and the final chapters of Ronald Knox's The Three Taps. See you then.